right so this time it is recording from the right channel all right so on with the, um, the video editing tool that I want to show you guys because you might find it useful for your presentation um, the only downside of this software is it is Linux only um, which basically means you know you can <coughs> either have Linux already installed on your system and you can use it you know, pretty easily it's just one package with most uh, distributions of Linux or if you want to just use the Linux like you know for only a few occasions uh, you can burn a DVD you can burn a live DVD which is basically what I do you know, in this class you know every single class um, then you can basically just reboot your computer into Linux use the tool you know on the live DVD for whatever you want to do when you're done with it you know just you know um, shut down the system and then when you reboot, you know, after you remove the DVD or the uh, flash drive, it will be back to, back to Windows, okay? So that's the easiest way to kind of experiment with Linux and tools that are Linux only without having to re reinstall everything and you know, kind of risk you know, blowing up your, your Windows hard drive and stuff like that. Or having to partition. Hmm? Or having to... Or you have to repartition. Yeah, repartitioning always has a, you always run a small risk of you know doing you know, some kind of damage, uh, but this way there's no damage whatsoever. You know, and you can work out of a live DVD and an external hard drive completely. You know, without you know an internal hard drive. So I just want to show you, you know, how easy it is to uh, make this work. So we'll uh, just do a quick demonstration. The software is called OpenShot. Okay, it's a it's a video editor. It's open sourced, so it's free. You know, you can use it. You know, and you can redistribute it as many times as you want, you know, along with you know all the other stuff that you can do with open source software. Um, so the first thing you can do is to import um, media files. So media files in this case would include SVG, uh, scalable vector graphics files. So if you want to make you know opening scenes and closing, you know, and stuff like that, you can use SVG files for that purpose. You can also import uh, still pictures, you know, just you know, plain images, you know, photographs and stuff like that. You can um, import video clips, okay? It will read and use most video clip formats um, that you can use on cell phones and whatnot. So, let's see, how should I do this? Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I have a Mac and I was wondering if iMovie works. Um, you can use iMovies if you want. I mean, I'm pretty sure it has, you know, I at know least... Huh? I know how to use that. <laughs> you don't know how to I know use I know it. How. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can probably use that if you want to. Mm -hmm. How about Movie Maker? Movie Maker. Movie Maker. Windows. That will probably work. Um, this one includes all kinds of you know really cool transitions and stuff like that too. So I just want to do a quick demonstration. Um, the first thing I want to do is to go online and you know get a few pictures. So we'll get some pictures of computers because it's related to this class, right? Okay, so we'll get a few images. Take a few pictures here. Um, the resolution is kind of can be important, so I'll save this one and create a folder just for you know, just for this demonstration. So I just call it you know, demo. Oh, I forgot I cannot create folders from here. Also, you know, this little demonstration also kind of reinforces, you know, something that we have uh, talked about already. Um, for instance, if I have a, uh, if I look at the picture like this, do you think I can use this without any licensing or letting people know that I'll be using this? If I want to use an image, what should I be using? You know, instead of just looking for computers, what should I be looking for? Stock as well? images. Hmm? Stock images. 
stock images, stock images, but most stock images are also licensed, so we want to look for Creative Commons. Now, when you look at Creative Commons you know, pictures, um, it's basically you know saying that, do you guys still remember Creative Commons? It's kind of like open source, but it's not for programs, and instead it applies to artwork and other types of uh, creative work, including writing, music, and so on and so forth. Um, it is still licensed, okay? If, someone, if something you know, says it is you know, licensed under the Creative Commons license, there are like you know, six subcategories or so, but it means that you can use the light, you can use the image as long as um, you do not claim credit. You know, you do not claim that I made this. Um, and in some cases, you cannot make modifications either. Um, in uh, some other cases, you cannot use it for commercial purposes. If you're using that image and you're making money out of it, um, you know, the creator of the image you know, can require you to um, get a license first. So we'll go ahead and take a look. Well, this is a good one. Right click on a few of these. <coughs> All right. And we'll save the image into the folder. I thought I created oh, one. Demo's right there. Is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's not. So we'll just call this, you know, IMG1. Because when we click it, we get a better version of it. Yeah, I think it saves that very cool. Mm -hmm. Assuming it didn't jump to a different page, I think it saves it. Yeah, we'll just overwrite it. So we got one image. Um, and we have another one here. look for some video clips. The problem with uh, video clips is it's kind of hard for me to um, get one and make sure it's also licensed under the creative license and also download it. I don't have the plug-in in Chrome yet you know with uh, downloading videos. But we'll just you know, start with the uh, two pictures. Um, we can get back to the tool here. Um, we'll go to import files and go to our demo folder. So we'll highlight both of these and basically add these. Would you like to import IMG1 as an image sequence? No. Um, basically just you know two different images. Um, you can also use music. The next question is you know, how do you use music without having to worry too much about licensing? Can I just go to YouTube, you know, you know, download you know some video and extract just the audio content? Probably not. Um, YouTube actually has some kind of automated engine to make sure that you know you are using you know uh, music content with proper licensing. I do not know how they check it, you know. But if you try to use something and without a license, you know they can they can catch it. You know for some reason they can just catch it. It's either reported by other people or you know it has some sort of internal engine to recognize the music and say, oh, okay, this is the same music as you know, this licensed product, so they will, it will actually come back and ask you, do you have the license to do it, okay? Um, so we want to kind of avoid that um, if possible. So one thing you can do is to use a MIDI file, M-I-D-I file, because most MIDI files are not licensed, um, because they are basically just you know, the electronic version of a score of a piece of music, and many times you know, that is not uh, it's not copyrighted, okay? Especially when you try to use something that is really old, like you know something that was composed by you know, Johann Sebastian Bach, you know, back in the Baroque period. I don't think he would come back and say, you know, I demand you know some licensing fees or I demand your know, loyal royalties from you. So we can do, we can we can go with that. <coughs> so we'll go look for you know Bach, B A C H, and MIDI. So there are many uh, pages for that. Let's see here. Just have to find something that is free. Two part conventions. Okay. It doesn't 
end, I mean, it's not a MIDI file. MIDI index. And it's not. All right, fine. We we'll go. Look for something else. So here's a MIDI file, and downloading the file is easy. The next question is, what do I do with a MIDI file, right? Um, remember what a MIDI file is, is it's basically just um, how to play the instrument. In other words, they're basically notes, but recorded in an electronic way. Um, most of the time, people use MIDI files when they have sequencers and all sorts of other you know, studio type you know, music equipment. Um, if you have a synthesizer, uh, the MIDI file can be very useful. In the good old days, you put a MIDI file onto a floppy disk, and some of these you know, sequencers you know, can have a little floppy disk drive to. So you put a floppy disk in, and it will be able to play the MIDI file from the floppy disk. Um, I don't have a you know, synthesizer here, or do I? Do I have a synthesizer okay. in this classroom? Absolutely. Even your cell phone you know, can act as a synthesizer. All right, so with the synthesizer, so the next thing I have to do is to start up the synthesizer and then import the MIDI file. The application, which is also installed in here, uh, I cannot start it from the GUI. For some reason, they do not include it in the GUI. It's called LMMS. Now, LMMS, you know, is a very interesting software. Um, I'm not a music person. You know, for those of you, you know, who are really, you know, into music, you can probably recognize you know, this screen as, you know, a kind of like a studio type of sequencer slash. Um, it, it can do a lot. Okay. So the next thing is, you know, I just know the basic stuff. I go to project. I go to import. I go back to my download folder because everything is in the, into downloads, and I have a few, you know, music files here already. Um, I have last Christmas. Let's be more um, seasonal. Is, is there objection of using your know, last Christmas? You okay? No one's objecting to the uh, religious connotation. No, we good. Yeah. All right. Skyfall. Okay, we'll do Skyfall. Then. Okay, so it's now importing the music file. Now, in the same MIDI file, it's not just one instrument. It's actually, it actually includes all kinds of instruments. And it also indicates which channel is supposed to be which instrument. This software can kind of automatically map the instruments. So it will find the best match to the music or the instruments that is requested by the software. Okay, And we can take a quick look here. It seems like you know, it did a successful import. So I'm going to crank up the volume just a little bit. And you know, use the software because you know most of the time it you know it's too loud to begin with. So I'm gonna and it's nothing. intro part you know. so it's not too bad I just have to change the uh, the volume so it's you know a little bit better. this works, I cannot put a MIDI file into uh, OpenShot because OpenShot can only deal with WAV files, you know, AUG4BIS, you know, MP3, and so on and so forth. 
So I have to export you know, the music from MIDI into a format that OpenShot can deal with. And this is actually fairly easy. You just go to the project again, this time use export, and I can export into the folder, I will do a demo folder for today, and choose you know, to use uh, AUG Vorbis, um, which is a fairly you know, useful format for open source you know, stuff. Um, for non-open source stuff, most people want to use MP3 or AAC files. You know, if you have an Apple, um, but for open source people, you know, this is the this is the music format to use. So I'm going to change it to um, just music and then save. Um, I have options here to select you know compression and stuff like that. And once again, you know, we are reusing concepts that we have learned already. Do you guys still remember sampling rate and? You know, bit rate and stuff like that. We kind of talked about this stuff you know, like really early in this class. Uh, sampling rate has to do with, um, I just want to kind of make sure that you guys do remember this stuff. Sound wave, you know, if you capture it and look at it from the oscilloscope perspective, it's kind of like this, okay? You know, most of it is basically you know, a sine wave. Sampling means, you know, how frequently do I sample and say, oh, at this time, you know, it has this level. At this time, it has this level. At this time, it has this level. The fewer or the lower the sampling rate, the coarser the music will sound because it, can, it just cannot capture the higher frequencies. If your sampling frequency is not at least twice of the frequency that you're trying to sample and capture, it cannot do it. Okay, it's just a mathemat mathematical kind of thing. 44, um, what is your, what, okay. Who in class do you think has the best you know, hearing? Definitely not me. Okay, most of the, usually the younger the person, you know, the better the hearing, you know, because you know, uh, a younger person can hear more of the higher frequency, and then as you know, people age, you know, you kind of start to lose the ability to hear the higher frequencies. So, what? How high of a frequency do you think you can hear? Yeah, about 20,000, you know, 20 kilohertz, you know, one kilo is 1,000. So 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz is about, you know, the ceiling of even a, a good, a person with good hearing, okay? Uh, for me, it's probably down to maybe 12,000 or so, you know, because, you know, over the years, you start to lose the capability to um, hear high frequency sounds. So this is twice, okay, 44,000 hertz is actually twice the frequency of the highest frequency that a, per, a, a good person, a person with good ears can hear. So that's actually not a bad uh, uh, sampling rate. But some people, you know, claim to have, you know, really sensitive hearing, and they can bump the sampling rate even higher to even the highest sampling frequency. It is really unnecessary for this purpose, so I'm just going to stick with 44, 100. Bit rate has to do with, um, because <coughs> AUG for BIS is a compressed or a lossy compressed uh, format, you can basically trade quality for the size of the file. Okay, if you can you know, live with you know kind of like mediocre uh, sound quality, you can change the bit rate to a lower bit rate. In other words, you can you know get it all the way down to 64 kilobits per second. This will work if you're just listening to the music when you're driving and you're driving a fairly noisy car. Okay, because you know it wouldn't be helpful you know e even if we use a higher bit rate. Uh, 160 to 192 kilobits per second is kind of like a common bit rate that me most people use. It's a good trade-off between quality and the size of the file. If you go to 256 or 320 kilobits per second, your, your file size will get bigger. In other words, compared, if you compare 160 kilobits per second versus 320 kilobits per second, the file size would double. Okay, But these, the quality of sound would improve but it's really hard to say whether it is twice as good, right? So it all depends on, you know, do you have the storage on the device to store, you know, a, uh, uh, to, so to store music and code it using 320 kilobits per second? And also depends on your ears. Do you have the speakers or the headphones and the ears to appreciate the music at this type of, you know, uh, fidelity? So a lot of stuff, you know, it depends on a lot. Um, I would just go ahead and use, you know, 128 kilobits per second. Uh, the depth, okay, this once again has to do with the sampling, because once you sample, okay, this is a most likely a irrational number. In other words, it has an infinite number of digits, okay? 
So how do we store a value like this you know, using a fixed number of digits? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether we're dealing with base 2, base 10, or you know, any other type of odd bases. If you can only have a, a fixed number of digits, you cannot fully represent a irrational number, period. Okay? That's just the way it is. So if I can only have like four levels, then it will be very coarse. Because I, if this is a rough uh, uh, approximation of the actual you know, uh, sound pressure. On the other hand, if I have eight levels, it will be better. If I have 16 levels, it's even better. Okay? So that's what the depth is about, you know, when you look at the depth here. <coughs> it's using 16 bit integers, which means, you know, I have, you know, out of the entire range from all the top all the way to the bottom, I have approximately 65,500 uh, different levels, which is good enough for most applications. If you're running a studio, okay, and you need to do all types of editing with music, it's not good enough. Okay, most studios would use, you know, 18 to 20 bit. But for you know, ca kind of more casual purposes like what we are doing here, 16-bit is more than sufficient for our purposes. Okay, so you know this is basically just it really is interesting. It's a, a re, it's a refamiliarization re of stuff that we have talked about in earlier in the semester. So now I'm going to I click start and it's starting the conversion. In other words, it's converting from the MIDI file into a org vorbis file right now. Now once it's you know imported or exported into an org vorbis file and you have a like let's say a uh, uh, portable player that can also you know play org vorbis, you'll be ready to play that clear music without any synthesizer. Can anyone think of you know, one of the really quote unquote original handheld uh, synthesizer that is really well known, you know well I wouldn't say well known but many people use it only for that purpose. They purchase this a little handheld device and say, I'm going to use it, but only as a synthesizer, you know, to kind of, uh, and also mix and create music on the fly. Can anyone imagine what device I'm thinking, I'm talking about? It's not your iPhone. This predates the iPhone quite a bit. It's the DS, Nintendo DS. The Nintendo DS has an application, you know, one of the cartridges, uh, which let people you know, just play music and also record music on the fly. And it's, uh, you know, it's apparently it's a very, has a cult following. What's it called? I cannot remember. I do not know. But we have the internet. But if you look up Google, you will find it. Nintendo DS um, Music Pad. It's one of these, you know, apparently there are quite a few apps, you know, for the Nintendo DS for music purposes. It's interesting, you know, you see people using a DS, you know, you think they're playing games, but they're actually, you know, they're doing the DJ thing, you know, and also using it to play music live. You know, really interesting application of a DS. I'd be curious to see uh, how well or how good a sound quality would be able to if you were to hook it up to a sound system for like audio. I do not know. It depends on the hardware of the DS, but the DS actually has specialized hardware for music purposes. Um, so you know, I think you know, some people say it's actually reasonably good. I have not used it, so I cannot comment. <laughs> okay, back to our stuff here. So back to OpenShot, which is here. So now I can also include that file. So I go import, and you know my music file is now a part of it too. I go to title. I can create you know a title. It already has some templates. Okay, if you want you know special type of you know titles, you can choose a template. You know I it, I'm not gonna make this too fancy. So I'll just a standard one. Okay, so I'll just say you know demo. And this is the name of the file, you know, the title file. Before we do this, I probably want to save the file first. So save project to the same folder that we uh, that we are using. So others go to demo. And we'll just give it a name. 
then when you save it, you can also save it, you know, using different types of templates. It depends, this part depends on, you know, what is the final output? What do you intend to do with the entire production? Um, the default is DVD NTSC. I guess, you know, that's the most popular one. Um, when was the last time you used a DVD disc? A day or two ago. A day or two? Okay, I haven't touched a single DVD for years. <laughs> Because you know the DVDs that I own, you know, I just digitize it and store it on the hard drive on the computer, um, so I don't run the risk of scratching the DVD. And the DVD is kind of safely stored away, you know, somewhere else. And I don't lose the DVD either, you know, especially when you have kids and they have a favorite, you know, DVD that they want to play. You know, that one will get scratched up pretty easily or get lost, you know, step on and stuff like that. You know, once you put it onto a computer, you don't have to worry about anything like that. But why, what would be one of the reasons why we don't want to use DVDs anymore? Or not NTSC anyway. What is NTSC? It's a signal um, standard. And what is the resolution of NTSC? Not very good, right? It, it is sub 720p. And what is the resolution of your television? at least 720p, right? I mean, you cannot even buy anything that's less than 720p now. So that means, you know, when you record it using NTSC DVD, you are not using the full capabilities of the playing device itself. So, you know, for this project, you know, it's okay for the demonstration, it's no biggie. So we'll just use NTSC. I'm just saying that, you know, for in general, um, you might want to consider using some of the other options, especially when your still images and also your video clips are already at 1080p. Because if the source material is already at 1080p and you're down converting everything to NTSC, you're only losing content, clarity, and sharpness in the process. So, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Okay, I'm saving the project. Now I can uh, go ahead and create a title page. So go ahead and create a title. And it, it also has animated titles. I'm just gonna go for the easy ones. So I have to give the title file name and now we can create a title and then the subtitle is of open shot all right apply and you can see that it just created a, a different file called title1.svg um, the extension svg stands for scalable vector graphics there's another program called Inkscape. You know, I think I demonstrated Inkscape a little bit in this class too. You can also use that one to create the SVG file <coughs> that you can also incorporate into uh, OpenShot. So OpenShot is not really just about photographs and you know, video clips. It also accepts a variety of formats you know, of, of media. It doesn't have to be something that you capture. It can be something that you draw, something that you create you know, using some other means. All right. So we'll just go ahead and say, you know, we'll start with, you know, just these four. And um, we have two tracks you know, by default. You can delete tracks and also add tracks if you want to. But for something like this, you know, with video and you're know, having to fade in and fade out, I'll use three tracks. One track I will only use for music. So I will just drag the music track into here. And because this is a music track, I can turn off the video you know, just, in, just to make sure that the software doesn't get confused and you know, try to incorporate video from this track. And at any time, you can actually play it to see what it looks like. And this is what it looks like right now. Where's my music? There we go. All right, well, but that's okay because you know, we did not specify any uh, bitmaps, right? So the next thing we can do is to drag in you know, the still images. Okay, so I can drag one here, and we'll drag the other one over here. Okay. And rewind our timeline back to here, and then play it. I guess this is before the, uh, the starting. <laughs> Okay, so you know you can easily see that you can preview you know, pretty quickly, 
And I forgot my title. So let's go ahead and make room for the title too. So the title is over here. Drag it down to track one. I'm just trying to locate the, the starting part of the music. Okay, about there. So we'll give it a few, you know, one second you know, before that. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is, you know, I really don't want it to have, you know, six seconds of dead space, you know, of nothing. Um, I want to shorten it, you know, to change the beginning of the music track so it starts from there, okay? Um, can you, just looking at the screen right here, can you tell me or guess, you know, what I need to use? Scissors. No, nope, it's not the scissors. It's the resize, you know. It's the double-sided arrow. Now once you use, you use this tool, you can you know, change it so it begins, so the music, you know, is, is shrunk. In other words, you know, I just you know, remove the beginning part of the music, so it will only have like a one second depth space before uh, we start the actual music. So let's go ahead and rewind it and try it. All the way to the Okay, let's just say that you know, this is another transition and I want to you know, remember this transition because it's important. Because you want to kind of synchronize your images with you know, the music you know, for the best effect. So this is an important point. I can also use this tool here. It is inserting a bookmark, so to speak. It's called a marker, but it really serves the purpose of a bookmark. So you can insert as many markers as you want, you know, of all the important time points, you know, of your video. Okay. So once I have this point here that is marked kind of important, you can see it's, it's a green arrow. I can now go back to the resize tool and make my title page, you know, just a little bit longer to at least, you know, get to the green arrow about here, and then my second image, I can you know, start about from here. And I want to uh, kind of schedule a uh, transition from, from the opening title to the image, okay? So can anyone kind of imagine what to do when I need a transition? Just looking at the screen here, tell me what I need to do. Transition. Go to the transition tab, exactly. <laughs> Go to the transitions tab. And we have you know, a ton of transitions that you can pick from. Some of these are really fancy. Some of these are you know, like way too fancy. Um, I'll just use something simple, you know, a quick, an easy you know, a dissolve. And to arrange a transition, you just drag and drop it. Okay, just drag and drop it. And now we can go ahead and you know, just play it again and see what it looks like. how easy it is okay now you know for the second clip you know now we haven't even incorporated any actual video footage okay these are all just you know still images um, if you have any type of video footages um, you, ha you have all sorts of special effects that you can apply like slow-mo you know if you watch you know the matrix you know you remember you know in some of the motions you know they would you know do with the actual real life speed and then they would suddenly, you know, just at a certain point, you know, they would slow down to dodge the bullets and whatnot. And then it would speed up again. You can do it very easily with using this tool. Okay. So you can achieve, you know, like you know, speed up. You can also you know make motion go faster if you want to. Slow it down. And I'm just going to finish this one, you know, by um, making this clip a little bit longer. And change my timeline to here. See, without the transition, you know, the, um, it just cuts over from one track to the other track, you know, really sharply. So once again, you know, let's pick something else. Let's pick uh, circle in to out. So I'm gonna stash it here. You can also see that it, the snapping tool is on. When the snapping tool is on, which is the little magnet here, when the snapping tool is on, it automatically calculates, you know, where it should start and where it should end. 
Um, you can use a resize tool if you want to, to um, you know, kind of help with you know, the transition. See that part? So it's a very easy way to make a presentation. What if you want to add you know, a track of your own voice, you know, narrative? You just add a new track, okay? So you can basically just go to this tool here, add a new track, and include your, your own voices, okay? Um, you can either overlay your voice on top of the music, or you can transition from the music to, to your own voice and then back. So there are different ways to arrange it. Are there any questions about using this tool? Would you call it easy to use? I would say it's pretty easy. It's also free, okay? Um, now the really nice part is you also have you know, effects. In other words, you know, not only for um, the music, but also for the images, you can also have different types of effects. I will demonstrate you know, just the blur, okay? And you will go like, you know, who would intentionally try to blur a picture, right? Well, I'll show you. It's really, it's really, really cool. Um, before we do that part, let me change the dissolve here so that the dissolve starts from the beginning. So use the resize tool here and change the dissolve so it's only going to overlap that part. And if you want to zoom in, okay, you just you know, click this bar here and now you can zoom in because I'm going to do some more work with just the title. So I want to zoom in a little bit so I have a little bit, um, I can see the timeline a little bit better this way. All right. So let's go ahead and apply the blur effect, okay? To apply the blur effect, drag and drop. And you can see that you know, the, the title page now has a little star next to it, which means you know, it has you know, these, this particular special effect already integrated. All right, so let's rewind the tape all together and start from the beginning. Oh, great, you know, it's not, cannot see a single thing. Well, what am I going to do? Right click, go to properties, and then go to effects, and click blur. So right now it is at a constant, you know, 50, you know, it goes from zero to 200 for some reason. Um, zero means, you know, no blurring, and 100, you know, I guess, I guess 200 means, you know, totally blurred. There's nothing you can make out, you know, from the image. So I can, what, what I can do here is I can say, you know, start with 50, but end with one, okay, which means I don't have any blurring effect at the, at the very end. And it doesn't go down to zero, it goes down to one, I guess one means no blurring. So I just click apply. Get a preview there. 